Welcome to Manchester Literature Festival. Um, I'm Mona Arshi and it gives me great pleasure to be hosting this event tonight. Um, I'm hosting an event with um, a poet um, and a writer, an essayist and a dancer and her name is Tishani Doshi. Tishani Doshi is a widely acclaimed as a poet and creative writer. Her first book of poetry, Countries of the Body, published in 2006, won a forward prize for best first collection. Her other collections include Everything Begins Elsewhere, published in 2013, and Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods, 2018, both published by Blood Axe Books. Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods was shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award and Firecracker Award. Tishani Doshi is also a dancer training with one of Indian's dance leading choreographers, Chandra Lekka. In conversation with Granta magazine, Doshi has said, dance is always immediate. In that fleeting moment, there is such completeness. I've never felt it as a poet, and that is why I'm doubly grateful to dance, for having experienced the loneliness and the terror of the empty stage, but also to have had that live connection. Her most recent collection that she's reading from today and we are celebrating is A God at the Door, which was published by Blood Axe Books and, bit, and also has also been shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best Collection. I just want to tell you a little bit about the praise um, the God at the Door has already received. Um, the TLS referred to, to the book as poems that delve into the conflicts between disaster and renewal, between past and present. They are tender inquiries rather than resolutions. The Guardian refers to the book as visionary responses, stunning and ambitious. But my favorite review so far has been in the poetry review where uh, the reviewer talks about her tremendous risks with form, alliteration, rhyme, half rhyme, and refers to Tashani's syn syncophated Doshi-esque music as liberating as Sarjani Naidu and as contemplative as Louise Gluck. Speaking more recently about writing in lockdown and, and something I want to hear more from, um, uh, Tashani has said, you learn that place is just an illusion and writing and an imagination takes you wherever you want to go. Writing is a way to transcend all things that trap you or hold you in real life. It is great power. And more poignantly, recently in lockdown, Tashani Doshi has said, I do feel that the most magic part, especially of poetry, is to have it spoken, to have an audience and the electricity. When we do get back to that, it'll all be all the more powerful. I think the online readings are a way to send little signals to say, here we still are. So here we still are. Um, welcome to Shani Doshi. Thanks, Mona. Thanks for that lovely introduction. It's, it's wonderful to see you and to be here in this medium, um, as good as it gets for the moment. Yeah. As good as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. And I, um, I'm really um, so just itching to hear, hear the work itself. This book has been living with me for the last couple of months. As you can see, it's very dog-eared. But can I just say that that is a sign of a well-loved book? <laughs> well, happy um nice to see it um so shall i just start with a few poems and then then we can maybe chat for a bit That'd be great okay um i'll start with a poem um called advice for pliny the elder big daddy of mansplainers um and uh it's it's a kind of shape poem which i have a few of in the book and uh, this one is in the shape of a menstrual cup and uh, can you see I, I hope you can see and uh, hopefully that will become apparent as I read the poem. Advice for Pliny the Elder, big daddy of mansplainers. Great man, now that you are dead, allow me to squeeze your hand. The sage bushes in Umbria are heavy with bees, so I'm killing them with hypnosis. I am a mere woman, inferior lettuce, but I understand swoon, a.k.a. miraviglia. I fill this cup with nectar and offer it to soothe your Vesuvian wounds. I share your love of baths and classification. And sure, if we had to point to a god in the sky, why not call him Thunderbolt? I too believe 
sewers are the great architectural invention. I do all my searching on roads. It has been 2000 years, so we can forgive some of your assertions. The sea mouse who helps whales find their way by parting the brows above their eyes, the one-eyed humans and skyopods with umbrella feet, the whole exotic bestiary. If I had no mouth, but could live off the smell of apples, I'd move to Kashmir, scratch that, maybe Sussex. Once a month when the blood comes, I go out to lie in whatever field I find to feel the scorch rise and the crops wither. Our powers are much depleted. I can stand among men in full swing of my menstruous and nothing will dim their ability to tell me about me. There are birds at the window this morning I can't name and dogs in the valley beyond who are using their bell-shaped lungs to announce their happiness again and again and again. Nothing has changed. We worry about the wane and winnow. In your time, perhaps the ladies use bits of cut up smocks, but these days we have menstrual cups. Desire is still a kind of ruin. That silly bird fluttering against the window net, trying to get in, the body's steady lilt towards oblivion. They say you had a sister, like Shakespeare's, mostly overlooked that it was she who first noticed the smoky clouds that sent you on your way. Dear Pliny, I guess you never heard the one about curiosity. The cat is real. The earth never tires of giving birth. If you get too close to a volcano, you should know it may erupt. This next poem um, was written like a few of the poems in the book in responses to news articles. And um, uh, this particular poem, I mean, yeah, the, the article that I was reading was about how um, 21 million Indian women had been denied the right to vote because their names were not on the electoral register. And, um, you know, as you know, in previous books and previous work, I have been looking at uh, sort of violence against women and gender violence and disappearances. And I felt that this was a disappearance of a different kind. I mean, 21 million is like the size of Sri Lanka. And it's just this sort of this, you know, this huge vanishing and huge taking away of power. Um, so yeah, the poem came about from imagining I would meet these women somewhere. And it's called, I found a village and in it were all our missing women. I found a village and in it were all our missing women holding guns to the heads of birds. They'd heard the voting had begun, that it had been going on for years without them. They knew their sisters had been bribed with gas cylinders and bicycles that even grandmas grabbed bags of rice in exchange at the ballot. They showed no resentment, left all their gold to the descendants of a Mongolian war princess with whom they shared a minor percent of DNA. I found a village, a republic, the size of a small island country. Sorry, I found a village, a republic, the size of a small island country with a history of autogenic massacre. In it were all our missing women. They'd been sending proof of their existence, copies of birth and not quite dead certificates to offices of the registrar. What they received in response was a rake and a cobweb in a box. The rake was used to comb the sugarcane fields for wombs lost in accidental hysterectomies. The cobweb box became an installation to represent the curious feeling of sitting backwards on a train, of life pulling away from you even as you long to surge ahead. They were not fatalistic. 
could say apocalyptic fatigue and extinction crisis in quick succession after several rounds of Mai Tais. I found a village with the sacred tree shot free of all its refugees in whose branches our missing women had hung colored passport photos of themselves. Now listen, a woman is not a bird or chick or anything with wings, but a woman knows the sound of wind and how it moves its massive thighs against your skin the sound of house swallowed by sinkhole, crater, tunnel, quicksand, quake, the collective whoosh of a disappearing, the way a gun might miss its target, the way 21 million might just vanish. And um, this one is also inspired by a news item, but of a slightly different nature. Um, I was listening to the BBC as you do, and it was talking about a procedure, a surgical procedure called the Brazilian butt lift. And um, I think, uh, yeah, let's say that it intrigued me. So I did some investigation. So this poem is called, um, Why the Brazilian Butt Lift Won't Save Us. The body refuses happiness. That was once upon a time. That was long ago when you could run naked through a field without consternation, you and your perfectly sized baby parts. The body grows dissatisfied once it starts towering over dogs and staring into the hearts of kitchen counters. Pretty soon your altar body is calling from a downtown phone booth saying, listen, baby, you need to step up the retinoids. We know, don't we, that a forest is being truncheoned as we speak, that a girl in that forest is being truncheoned too, a girl or a hundred, that all the words we have for my heart can't take it anymore, won't be able to describe what happens to the body at the end of that. Still, the body wants to be glorious while it can. It sees lips burgeoning like a hokusai wave and thinks, I'll have some of that. It sees bones Caravaggio might have dreamed of and microbladed eyebrows and neat marble apples the size of a generously cupped hand and says, yes, 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 but mostly it sees Kim Kardashian's ass rising like a mountain out of the Atlantic and thinks, I too want to oversee a metropolis. And why shouldn't it? Aren't we all trying to get back to a time before the blemishes when the body was carefree with no stretch marks and pristine platelet rich hair? an origami crane built to withstand the damaging effects of light, gusting on thermals to fly against any mushroom cloud. So what's a few small wounds to the forehead? What's a needle the size of your life? Tashani, thank you so much for that, for those readings. They were wonderful poems. And I mean, I've been spending some time with um and with the book, and I, I know your previous um collections as well, and and your essays and and this constant probing of the body. And for me, the what's very surprising about this book, although is that although it's having a conversation with your previous books, is it it seems like your most radical radical and political work. And, and there's a sort of urgent energy that's often inside the long titles of your of your um of, of your poems. So I wanted to ask you about that, about um a, a, a quote actually that I heard Ted U. Cole talking about when he was talking about writing, how does how do an how does an artist write in the disaster? How how are you writing poems in the disaster? How how are you able to transform what is going on? You're living in India, um, where there is a sort of um, a silence, and then there's a kind of violence of um, and and a sort of uh, 
a kind of uh, war on the body, on female body. I wanted to just really talk to you about how that feels like in terms of responding to that in poetry mm. and how you manage to do that. Yeah, I mean, the question of the body has been central to all my books from countries of the body and all throughout, uh, through Everything Begins Elsewhere and Girls and then this one, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about how being a dancer helped me become a poet, even though I was a poet first. And it sort of, it really gave me that grounding. Um, and so the body for me is the eternal subject. It's the place from where everything begins. And perhaps no other time has it been more uh, brought into focus than the beginning of last year at the start of this pandemic. And everything has become so disembodied we have very little chance to be in the same room with people. And we, we forget the ener energy that has. I mean, I taught my first class here at NYU in Abu Dhabi in person after a year and a half and we were bouncing, we were electric. And it was just, we didn't have to wait for our turn to speak and in the little box, you know, we were people. And when my students came in, I, I, I didn't even recognize them. I just, who are you? And so there's this glorious um, ability of recognizing the embodied experience of going through the world. And yet at the same time, as you mentioned, the body is under attack. And it's not just, not just violence, not just gender violence, you know. In the Indian context, you could say violence against Muslims, violence against Dalits, so caste violence, uh, minority violence, uh, gender violence, you know, and it's not just India, it's everywhere. There's a sense of the body as being a receptacle for me, for the utmost passion, joy, beauty, power, um, and it represents all of that. And at the same time, the body is under attack and and if you look at it within the larger framework of the environment and climate change and species uh you know i think these are all the concerns that this book holds and and it has been perhaps that urgency or that sense of radical you use that word has come into it because the poems were written in this disembodied time and it's a way of asserting one's body because that's what we have, that's how we move through the world. And so for me, poetry is very much a kind of reckoning with several, you know, with dualities and with complications and lots of emotions. Um, but it's, it's also um, the place where it then comes to reside in the body. And it's a sort of coming together and an acceptance of, these things that are very difficult to accept, the things that we're bombarded with daily, the brutalities, but also, you know, the, also the beauty, also the fact that you, you, you know, you watch someone do a hundred meter sprint or you, or you, you see just, or you just see a, a small boy dancing or whatever, you know, these small things. And you just think how magic, how magic are these bodies that we carry around and how vulnerable, you know, and made more so vulnerable by the fact that this past year, we haven't been able to touch and reach out because our bodies have been the source of contamination and so all those things have been so much in my in my mind and and in these poems really your poems are really steeped with that I feel um and the interesting thing that I've noticed is that um you've always been interested in the longer line that's been a I, I'm going to use that word do doshiesque I just love that <laughs> it's 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 a sort of it, it's um an opportunity, I think, the long line for you to to um, move lyrically and very musically and, and with a muscularity into into the work. But there seems to be this this kind of like you know all all weapons down. I'm in a, and it feels as if you are it, you are taking the line and and using it much more expansively uh, in in the work. And I've noticed how much longer the the lines are. Um, and I wondered whether or not that was a sense of sort of urgency, this kind of grasping urgency to tell and witness where we are now and how, and I'm, I'm just really interested as to whether or not you were writing very, very quickly, because it feels like that in the poems. 
Um, I hadn't noticed about the longer line, but you know, I think with poets and with writers in general, you it's you kind of look back and say, oh, this book has this element to it, or that book, and in a way, you 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 see how one book is born from the other, and there's. I mean, I hesitate to use the word evolution, progression, like there's some kind of linearity to it, but I feel like somehow all these books belong to a family and some way you are changing with each thing. I don't know that I'm the best person to, to take note of what I'm doing. I just know that last year, there, I mean, I had been writing poems. I'm always writing poems, but I think the bulk of the book got finished last year. And really, I, 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 I wrote... I wrote my way through lockdown after lockdown, through bombardment after bombardment. And I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't been able to write. I know a lot of writer friends weren't able to. And this is the thing when this kind of crisis happens where um, we feel quite uh, under attack and there's, there's so much that we don't know and that we're grappling with and there's so much uncertainty. And so writing is not always the first thing that comes to hand, you know, but for me, I felt really compelled to, and, and it was a way of really rooting myself and feeling that this was the only thing that I could do in that moment. And so I think perhaps, uh, yeah, there was a real greed about writing these poems and, and, and finishing one and then getting to another one. And, 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 and it, was, it was an extraordinary experience for me because I think with the other books, it was much more organic and slower. And suddenly you say, oh, here's a collection and put it together, you know. And this one really felt like it was just, um, yeah, it had, a, it had an urgency and the tempo was, was very different. It's also interesting because um, there, is, there is so much beauty in the work, in the, in the, in, in the poems, but there is there is a sort of way of writing so that you are not pursuing beauty i mean it, that there's a sort of revelatory point of, of the poem which i find that you do you are able to do really skillfully and it's not really probably even skillful it's 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 just a very natural way of just you you being able to reveal the poem and and so the destination is isn't beauty but it, they sound so beautiful as well and you read them and they they transform when you when you read them i wanted to ask you about um, your last book and the relationship between the last book and this book, because I, I was very fortunate to come to your um, the launch of your last book uh, at Tara Arts, where you had uh, a powerful dance that animated a lot of the poems. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, of course, you're a dancer and you've spoken about your relationship between the art form and your, your writing. And I'd love to ask you about um, why what is there something shifted in this book in terms of your relationship with dance and and mm. why it was so integral to your last book i think um so i feel like the thing that has happened is that i lost my body a little bit in this um pandemic i i was i had also worked on a like a so after girls are coming out of the woods i worked on a small a longer choreography uh to kind of tour with my novel. And so this was like bringing together text and music and movement. And I think I had basically stopped touring with my main dance group and I didn't want to stop dancing. I didn't want to stop being a dancer because that was such an integral part of my identity and how I saw my process. So I figured um, I would just try to work on these small choreographies and, and solo pieces because I don't have a school or structure or anything so it was it's easier to work on my body and what's happened is that since I performed in Norway I guess in February last year and that was the last time I performed and it was the last time I you know I mean I still do my yoga and whatever but I'm just saying I I feel the disconnect with the body and I've not been able to find my way in through these poems to try and think of anything performative or anything um, so the poems are just there um, and they have their own power. And I always said, like, I don't feel obliged that I have to do a kind of, I have to present everything as a dancer poet or as a dancer writer, it's not necessary. But I, I do miss very much um, the, the combination of working with body and writing. And I feel that because we've all been boxed in this way and because our movement has been so restricted, uh, maybe that 
you know, it's kind of like how sometimes a form in a poem gives you a kind of energy and freedom and it gives the poem that power. And I think maybe that has been like working in my poems that this, this constraint of the pandemic in terms of the movement has given the poems this extra, you know, push, but it's definitely depleted my relationship with body. And I feel as if, and a lot of the poems have that, that sense of catching up with the body or the body bounding ahead or separate from the body. And it's not just my body. It's also like, I'm talking about these two girls during the plague and this like trying to invest and to, to, to imagine again what it meant to be fully in our bodies because I feel far from it. And I know that a lot of people have, have struggled with it. And so I think, um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't feel that sense of um, performance or dance with this one, but I feel like maybe the poems have their own extra energy, uh, which is a kind of, leftover or or some kind of you know a side uh, perk from from the pandemic I don't know well I mean they feel as if they're floating out of the body anyway you know they are it was very interesting last week I was in Manchester for the for for um, a festival the ripples of hope festival and suddenly it was the first festival I went to with poets and yeah. we haven't touched for such a long time and it well we were it was very, there were some very awkward moments with um, those kind of like primal interactions that you, we, we, we are so used to sort of engaging with are, are all dissipating and disappearing and we're le relearning how to be in our bodies with, with not only with ourselves, but then suddenly in, in with other people, just, you know, just, just like inches away from us. So yeah, I think we've, we, it's, we've sort of gotten used to this diminished existence we've gotten so used to that. And now suddenly that the, the, you know, it's been opened up somewhat, the borders have been pushed, we're allowed to do this and we're allowed to do that. And we have to relearn and we have to reclaim in some way, those relationships, those spaces. Um, and, 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 you know, it's useful to understand um, how to move forward because it's also a time of recalibration, right? Uh, everything kind of breaks down in a way and then we have a chance to rebuild. And it could also be a chance to take away those things that were not supportive or that were not excellent. So yeah, I think uh, it's a very, it's been a very potent time, let's yes. say, and how we emerge, now we see how we emerge, you know? Thanks, Tashani. Tashani, could we have three more poems from you? Sure, sure. So. This poem is called Instructions on Surviving Genocide. In the study of comparative trauma, it is important to ask how much have you suffered and is it enough? Hello, are you still breathing? No, this is not the time to speak of boots and grenades. Just nod if you want to be counted. Courtroom exhibit one, make way for the man with the funny mustache. Gosh, there are so many of them. Our enemies slip infertility pills into samosas, so we must be vigilant. Your family was wiped out? Come, there's a seat for you on the truck. Remember, cities rise and fall just as names of streets change from uppity colonial settler to local yoga lord. In any event, refuse to be devoured. Do not mess with the birthplaces of gods most massacres being propagated by God whisperers. Meanwhile, a woman in the square shouts about how there are many ways of taking a stand. The way she chooses is naked, with one leg here, the other there. Are you scared? They'll stuff her mouth and make her watch, subdue her ethnically recalcitrant womb, and despite all footage, the event will be blurred from the nation's memory span. Do not believe those who say it was wonderful before the war. Listen instead to those saying, get out, get out while you can. They work the streets, exhuming bodies, finding safety pins instead of buttons. There was a grand theater here, a library, houses with balconies. This was a good place with good people. Fathers were weavers of rugs. They passed down secrets through needles as if they already knew a day would come when all the able-bodied men would be taken away. The women, 
what more can be said about women, leave it. If history were a picture show and we kept editing the bits we didn't like, snip, 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 all we could agree on would be a field in the sun. A field is just a field after all, until you're introduced to the worms, until you find the bottles of rum, the coats glazed with pox, all handed out freely. Take one, take three. The victory of genocide relies on an understanding of pathogens. To receive a harpoon, you must be able to spell extirpation followed by this execrable race. There comes a point in the battle when the last international watchdog is forced to leave the country. Reader, I know you're prone to anxiety. This is when it happens. The lagoon, the ambush, bullets raining down in a no-fire zone, quick into my echo chamber. There were people who roamed the kingdom of earth without need of signposts or flags, while others made successful businesses of hanging over cliffs, trapping breeze into jars. But tell me, how will you breathe if your country that was your sky ancestor song is now the size of a parking lot. We're getting to the point. It's almost always about land. The flap in the door that promises garden, garden is really a trap. This morning on the radio, they were remembering S, but it could have been R or A, any litany of the alphabet. They begin with sad music to cue the genocide bagpipes perhaps or violins, but it could have been a lyre, sarod, swana, djembe, some ensemble of wind, string, horn, or better still, they could have gone straight to the throat of a well, dirge, wail, ululate. We can agree we need trigger music before talking of tragedy. I don't trust orphanages filled with adults or neighbors who keep track of your auras. Look, when you're unloaded from the truck, They'll point to a road. You'll see a meadow, a river, a house in the distance. Inside, perhaps a feast of chicken and rice. A soldier in the beret will say, go there to your people, your native people. I won't lie. It shimmers, everything beloved, a vision, a roof, waiting and complete. Take this picture, the sweetness then walk the other way. Listening to Abda Parveen on loop, I understand why I miss home and why it must be so. This frugal diet of living is getting to me. Sometimes in the desert, the wind will blow through my shell-shaped ears and whisper a sea song just to taunt me. If the end game is to renounce house, mother, father, husband, sibling, succulent child, to go in search of better hummus and woolen blankets, to choose one dog and run for the border, I'm not sure this contest was made for me. What if the dog ignores me? What if he refuses water from the tin cup I lay out for him? What if we become estranged? like Enkidu, ancient wanderer, and his herd? What if my dog finds himself a family of wolves and abandons me? What if I felt my heart was taken out of me? I could begin each day with praise, could serve and work without once uttering the word home, could write on multiple clay tablets, could even practice hieroglyphs, the symbol for voyage, a torn out eye, Falling man with blood streaming from head, apis, nandi, cosmic bull running into me. I would do it if it meant I could go back and everything would be as I left it. Bread on table, bowl of salt, apple tree, river and its stepping stones return to me. What if it was better to live with radiation than with war? What if home was Chernobyl? What if the well was poisoned, but the bird song made up for it? What if the ghost of all the shot dogs went to live underground with the worms? What if you didn't wake up asking, did it all really happen to me? What if we were birds forced to spend our lives in air, to mate and sleep on the wing, to rope round and round the earth in circles and have screaming parties? 
What if we were never meant to settle? Would you still search out my beak midair? Would you still find me? We are homesick everywhere. Even when we are home, we are empty things that need filling. We are always lost in love, never found. Please come find me. What if this minaret was like the last tooth in my head, unsteady and inflamed with devotion? What if I'm finally old and ready for the plant of rejuvenation, but no one's offering it to me? We're at that moment in the journey when we've hit a wall and the only way to scale it is to use your voice with its inflections and ditches, its rough grain and longing. What if God on the other side of that wall was equally alone and in need of company? What if we replace God with home? What if I was ready to become nothing? What if I understood there was no me? Would you carry me to this divinity? And I'll end um, with a poem called Many Good and Wonderful Things. And uh, it was written to commemorate the lives of the million and a half Indian soldiers who served in the Great War. And um, for this poem, I used some of the letters that the that the soldiers wrote home. Um, and uh, this poem takes a small extract. This is from Kala Khan to Iltaf Hussein, December 27, 1917. He writes, what more am I to say? Our kind hearted Sarkar has done everything possible for us to protect us from the cold. We are each provided with two pairs of strong expensive boots. We have way loyal to rub in our feet and for food, we are provided with live Spanish sheep. In short, the Sarkar has accumulated many good and wonderful things for our use. Many good and wonderful things. History too has a hard time remembering the black waters they crossed, the small mountain villages emptied of men. Death was different then. History is always reinventing itself. Say what you will, but clouds have remained more or less the same and leaving home is still leaving home, whether it's on a jet plane or climbing the steep path behind the house with the roll of bedding on your back. But to die in a faraway place whose name you can't pronounce for a king who isn't really yours is a sadness history still hasn't figured out. History has been pushing for republics since Lucius Junius Brutus, but men are hardy as the point or bullheaded. And you'd think the glories of lice making mansions in their shirts was a paradise they could do without. That trench living would make them walk across the front with arms held high saying, take me quick. I wish only to enter the realms of God. History tries not to be sentimental, although letters give things away. One fool longed for a flute. The world is burning, but he wants to play. Others were gluttons, mercenaries, spies. The wise asked for opium, but write sweets or dainties, they said, otherwise the package might not reach. History needs to forget the dead who cover the earth like heaps of stones who write, mother, is my parrot still alive? Mother, do not go wandering madly. Sometimes it feels as though the rain has been falling all your life and the girl you married will tire of tending the cattle. Do not worry. This is war where the women like metaphors are always steadfast and beautiful. In history's version, she sits under the peepal tree with your Victoria cross pinned to her sari. She has been waiting since 1918 and she is waiting still. So let us speak of love the way we always have by asking, have you eaten, darling? And what price did you get for the goats? And of course I miss you, but the earth is hard and the sky distant. And if I had wings, I'd fly to you. In Marseille, they said we looked like kings. 
History cannot really say what happens to men at war. So listen, at night I feed on stars. Do not ask about the cold. They have given me whale oil for my feet. And someone told me if I carried a piece of raw onion into battle, the bullets would not find me. Tashani, thank you so much. Those were absolutely incredible poems. And um, I'm very drawn by the fact that you are writing where um, you are also historicizing as you write. And I felt as if that, that particularly when you're talking about the body um, and, and where we are in terms of um, the mother body and the contradictions in the female body, that's something that you're investigating and, and probing all the time in your work. Um, and I think it's just in, 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 in such important work. And, and I really, really hope that, um, that lots of people read this book, this very important book. I'm, I mean, I'm so glad it's in the world. I have uh, a question for you because there's a, there's a poem that I really like, love you to read. Um, the title is, uh, We Will Not Kill You, We'll Just Shoot You in the Vagina. Um, and I know a little bit about where that kindling for that poem came from, because I remember hearing you talk about it, but I also was really affected by the way that you, you, you have written the poem in a sestina, which is sort of a unusual way of being able to, to capture the subject matter. Um, so, and I know you're a Bishop fan and, and, and you've written sestinas in the past. So I'd love you to read the poem and um, talk a little maybe about the relationship with you and that form. Sure. Um, I love sestinas. I think there's something so, um, you know, insistent about the way those words come around again and again and again. And I feel that sometimes poems require a certain form and, I, I, I return to the Sistina very often. My, I think one of my first ones was Memory of Wales. And it was about memory and childhood and, and meeting my mother in this small playground in Wales where in the village where she grew up. And um, ever since then, I've, I've sort of, I've always had one or two Sistinas in each collection. And this one is, is quite different in tone. Um, this one is a, a quote from the Philippine president uh, Duterte. Who, uh, who issued this warning to female rebels, uh, we will not kill you, we'll just shoot you in the vagina. Um, and um, yes, I felt that I had to respond to that in some way um, and um, bringing in also uh, certain issues from the Indian context. So uh, some words, the six words will, will um, make themselves known. We will not kill you, we'll just shoot you in the vagina. It's true, we're useless without our vaginas. How will you rape us? How will we birth daughters and sons? I understand we should laugh. It would be better if we did, Mr. Duterte. In India, our leaders say eating chow mein excites the hormones, which provokes rape. And if you can't prevent it, may as well enjoy it. Rape. In one of your 120 languages, the word for vagina is bisong, which sounds like a headlong bird, not chow mein, which good mothers don't feed their daughters for fear, for fear of provoking. You know, Mr. Duterte, may I call you Rodrigo? We should laugh. O'Keefe did when they said she painted bulvas, laughed. Her flowers didn't wear jeans or stay out late. Rape doesn't happen to respected ladies. Dirty Duterte, Baba Akko, what do you have against vaginas? What about Sarah and Veronica, your daughters and their drama queen vaginas? What about Chow Mein? Personally, I'm against MSG, FGM and Chow Mein. In Hindi, one of India's 780 languages, I laugh not to be competitive, but we win. The word for daughter is Beti. Do you know how many lost daughters, raped, unborn, disappeared? 
One longs for a Venus flytrap vagina or yoni, the most delectable word for cunt. Duterte, Harry, P-Rod, P-Diggy, Digong, Rodi, Duterte is Viagra, your excellency's version of chow mein. Who dares call you impotent? You who want vagina shot at, you who smooches factory workers, you who laughs and says, as long as there are beautiful girls, there will be rape. There is always a beautiful beti daughter. Our leaders warn us to keep our daughters at home like cars so they won't get scratched, Mr. Duterte. They tell us to call our rapist brother while they rape us and afterwards everyone can go out for chow mein because nobody agrees to do it on the first try. Laugh. Mr. President, we have teeth in our rebel vaginas and they don't need chow mein. Our vaginas have learned to shoot. They laugh and talk back, rapacious beasts. Our daughters feed them poems, Mr. Duterte. Thank you so much for reading that poem for me. It was a, a stunning poem. Um, I just um, want to say that all the details of the poem are taken from actual news articles and uh, it's just, I think, the the rage and the anger that's obvious in that poem, but also the tone comes from this sort of shock of having to, to have men in such positions of power all over the world, uh, whether it's Donald Trump saying that he can grab a woman's pussy or whether it's a village panchayat uh, man in India saying that, you know, if you, if you, or, you know, keep your daughter at home and she won't get scratched like a car. I mean, these are, these are actual things that, that men in power have said. And so the, the poem is channeling a lot of rage. Thank you so much for writing it because I think it just, it, this is what is such a, why, why it's so wonderful to, to, to read poems because it, listening to it and hearing you read it, there's the power is accreted in those words being, being repeated in the ear again and again. And I think that it is such a powerful, has such a powerful effect in the ear. So thank you. Um, I lastly just want to ask you, Tishani, about, I know you were involved in the Ripple's um, Hope Commission that Simon Armitage, he convened 30 poets to respond to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, um, I know that you responded to Article 6. So could you tell, a little bit, tell us a little bit about why it was that particular article that you responded to? Yeah, so Article 6 states everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. And um, I was immediately drawn to that one because of the word recognition. Um, it seems like such a simple request to be recognized as a person before the law. I mean, it's astonishing that it would even have to be an article. But I think the word recognition has so much meaning, so much weight. I mean, when we say I feel seen or, you know, I feel when, when something is made visible, when you feel that you have been recognized, it is such an empowering thing because so many people are made to be to feel invisible. So on one hand, I was thinking about the difficulty of knowing ourselves, which is an old philosophical question. And we are all trying to know ourselves to, to have the sense of being in ourselves as best that we can. Um, and then trying to know other people. And, and you know that idea that we're always looking in other people to recognize uh, some parts that will make us whole in some way. So I thought about that as a beginning. And then I moved on to the question of, um, well, to the power, I would say, of surveillance that we currently live in. And what does it mean? What are the politics of seeing when you have a billion surveillance cameras in the world, when so much of our information, our biometric data, our private information is collected and used and manipulated, and, 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 and when there's identity theft and, and, and you know all of this stuff happening, how then um, do the politics of seeing change and how then do we make this very simple embrace and reach across to say to someone, I see you, um, which, which remains a very fundamental and human um, need and, and a desire. Uh, so that's the one that I, I chose to respond to. So I want to thank Tishani Joshi for giving us such an electrifying reading and also her generous conversation. Um, 
all that remains now is for me to ask you to please support um, the poets and to buy the book. It's here. Um, it's published by Blood Axe and it's also available at Waterstones and all good booksellers. Thank you very much to Shani. Thanks, Mona. It was so lovely to see you and I was so happy for us to have this conversation. And thank you to the Manchester Literature Festival as well for organising this. We are now going to see that poem in a film by Tishani Joshi and the poem is called I See You, You See Me. I see you, do you see me? Once I was a boy in a frock. Once I was a girl struggling to climb out of a pool. I met myself at a seaside holiday. Remember that moment in childhood when you were innocent and then you were not. Remember what it was to look at the world after, how the doorway shifts and you deposit both selves in a lost and found box. The relief of discovery, of disappearing. You see me, don't you? I'm the one hanging photographs in a dark room, archiving the forest of myself. There's a gap between us the size of a sphinx. In this feathery winter light, the doorway shifts again. The aerial prints of my life expose all the secrets I wanted to hide. If this were a play, we'd be getting to the point where you recognize me and I recognize you. All the masks slip and everything is remade. Father killed, mother married. But listen, this is not Aristotelian tragedy. Let's not end in a bloodbath. We could return to the kingdom triumphant instead. After so many years of being lost, we could be twins with identical birthmarks, climb off the boat and leave our vests on the shore make mud images of ourselves and return them to the sea. The way idols are immersed and sent home after a stay with devotees. There is always the promise of a night sky, the what you are twinkle of a billion stars and surveillance cameras, a dizzying pixelated universe, our biometric futures miniaturized on a grain of sand. What could be so difficult about saying, I see you, I see you, I see you.